In this episode, we connect with an extended member of the DCX community all the way from Florida, the one and only Jordan Rayner. Through his books, podcasts, and free content, he helps people find meaning in their work and redeem their time in order to be purposeful, present, and wildly productive. You're going to love this conversation. If you want to know more about Jordan, go to jordanrainer.com. Jordan, thank you so much for being here. You were our- Zach. First ever audience selected DCX guest and redeeming your time was probably the most impactful book that I read last year. Uh, I realized, Oh my gosh, <laughs> my CTS is completely shattered. <laughs> and so yes. I am currently working through this framework to try and get things back together. Uh, lots I of grace it. involved in that process. Well, dude, I, so did a lot of events in 2022. I was telling you guys before we started recording. DCX was one of my favorites for a whole lot of reasons, uh, mostly because the crowd was top notch, but also that dope stage. We had a lot of fun together. Yeah. It was a really yeah. good time. Yeah. Hey, we've got to do it again. Come back down. We'll get some Let's tacos. Uh, we'll see if we can up Let's the ante it. on that stage this year. Yeah. So, <laughs> dude, thank you it's gonna for be tough. continuing the conversation and jumping back on here. Today, we're going to dive into your book, Redeeming Your Time. But first, if we could, I just want to do some lightning round questions. Let's do it. It's kind of like my favorite part of DCX is always the Q&A. Yeah, you love and those. And so here we go. Yeah. Right, I'm in it, the lightning capital of the world. I live for lightning rounds. Oh, oh perfect. Uh, I didn't know That's that. kind of scary. <laughs> Tampa Bay. That's right. Lightning little, capital of the world. Little, Hence our hockey team. Yeah. Nice. I, I was just I, in Tampa Bay, by the way, this last weekend. Yeah? Yeah. What? Yeah, my uncle Next time and you gotta let aunt me know. live about an hour north there in Spring Hill. And he turned uh, 85. This is the beauty Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is the beauty of rec of being an entrepreneur in Tampa. Everybody has an uncle in the Tampa Bay area. Yeah, that is <laughs> right? true. Like, oh, you, you already have family down That's here. That's right. That's right. Come on. You're going to retire here one day anyways. Like, yeah. just come down sooner. <laughs> we had a good time. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, cool. All right. Hey, so question number one. In Redeeming Your Time, you reference this Jewish guy as the most productive man in all of history. This guy named Jesus. Outside yeah. of Jesus, because a lot of times that's just the token answer, who's the most productive person? Ooh, this is tough. Uh, my mind immediately goes to somebody I talk about in chapter one of Redeeming Your Time, William Wilberforce. Mm. This guy who, um, at the age of, I think it was 27, uh, was already elected to the British Parliament, but became a Christian and realized, man, life's not about me, it's about others, and decided, you know what, before I die... Uh, no big deal. I'm going to abolish the slave trade throughout the British Empire. <laughs> and he did it. That's right? a big like, hero. Literally like three story. days before he died, um, he abolished the slave trade. And on his deathbed, wished he had accomplished more. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, he's one of my heroes. So that that's, that's, that's the first one that pops into my head. Love it. Well, my question's a little off topic, I suppose, but uh, a <laughs> huge Taylor Swift fan myself. So... Curious uh, as to what your your favorite song is of hers, or maybe even favorite album, if you can can't narrow it down to song. Oh man! So I keep coming back to "Lover" as my favorite mm -hmm. album, which is not a popular answer. Uh, so I, I think that's got to be my favorite song. Man, I was running to "All Too Well" ten minute version this morning. Mm -hmm. I think it's tough. I think that's tough to beat. But "Mastermind" is like mastermind i love because it's the reason why i love taylor yes i love taylor's music but mostly i think taylor is the greatest brand manager on the planet oh, and mastermind tells us why like every step is intentional uh people can call it conniving i call it strategic mm -hmm. uh and i just think she's a genius i totally agree i love it you never know what like you know she's just totally appealing to her audience she knows yes. exactly what she's doing and she makes everyone feel like they're a part of something which is so cool love it yeah it's funny i don't think of it in that way but you're absolutely right she is just an amazing brand manager she knows mm -hmm. exactly who the ideal client is mm -hmm. and frames everything out yeah well and she's kept me as a client since i was like 13 years old like and it doesn't matter her which songs, is mind-boggling yeah. And her songs are great. Like, like, I love them. But it doesn't matter what she does. I will be a fan. I, I don't care. 100%. There, I was just listening to this uh, podcast talking about, like, why was Fearless such a hit? Like, it actually didn't make sense. Like, that, that album's kind of, like, sonically consistent. It's, like, not that interesting. But, like, 
it was the perfect album to describe a teenage girl's experience. Mm-hmm. And like, that's why the critics didn't get it. Cause there were a bunch of old, like white dudes. And like, what's <laughs> up with this album? But like it sold like bonkers because she perfectly understood the customer because she spent so much time with her customers mm-hmm. and her fans. Mm-hmm. And Good. she wrote what go. she knew. Leadership lessons from right. Taylor. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that's, it. <laughs> that's it. I love it. I love it. Well, my question is going to zero in on our broader topic for the podcast, which is about the book redeeming your time, redeeming your time. What I love, what I would love to know and have our listeners here is, um, why did you write the book? And then more specifically, um, your heart and passion for what you want the reader, uh, to do with it. I, I know that yep. in writing the book, for instance, uh, you have those seven principles, uh, for your, for your readers. Um, but if they were going to walk away with just three things to do tomorrow differently, what would that be? Man, that's good. So let me chunk this up a little bit. Let's start with why the book. Because, man, I needed a compelling why before I sat down and spent 500 hours writing um, a book in a category that already has 60,000 titles in it, the time management category on Amazon. And so for me, it really came down to um, a couple things. Number one, just at a real practical level, um, I, I get asked a lot of time management questions. I, By God's grace alone, I'm a fairly productive guy, and so people are always asking me for advice. And over the course of a conversation with somebody trying to help them, I would recommend 12 books that that person absolutely had to read if they wanted to solve their time management problems, which is obviously the last thing somebody who's feeling swamped <laughs> and overwhelmed wants to hear, right? They don't have time to read one book, much less yep. 12. The problem was all 12 of those books I used to recommend dealt with one piece of a really large puzzle. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really know of a book that took all of the puzzles and connected them all together. Because let's face it, in those 12 books, you could probably distill it down to about 10 pages mm-hmm. each, right? And that's exactly what I did with redeeming your time. I said, all right, great. Let's just take the best of all this. Let's curate it together. So that was number one. I thought there needed to be a higher value per page, mm-hmm. an exponentially greater value per page and value density in a mm-hmm. book like this. And number two, at like more of a theoretical, theological level, um, I've read 50 books in this category over my career. I've read all the bestsellers in the time management category. And I never once read a book that accounted for how the most productive human being to ever walk the earth manage their time. Zach, we talked about this before. Jesus of Nazareth. Like, Christian or not, I think it's pretty hard to dispute that Jesus is the most productive human ever. A third of the world claims to follow his teachings 2,000 years after his death and resurrection. That's mind boggling, right? And the problem is like, we don't, we don't think that there are these great biographies written in Jesus life, but they are, they're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the first four, four books of the new Testament in the Judeo Christian Bible. Right. And so I looked at those biographies and said, can we learn anything about how the most productive human being of all time manages time? And I think we can. I think it's those seven principles. And out of those seven principles in the book, I think you can map out these 32 wicked practical practices to help people redeem your time. So, Chris, I promise I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> question. This is good. I love it. What are people going to walk away from this book with? Well, number one. I think they're going to walk away with a radically different perspective on how to find peace, mm. right? Because that that's what everyone's buying. When you're buying a to-do list app or a time management book, that's what you're searching for. You're overwhelmed, right. you're frantic, you're swamped, you're searching for peace. And I think only in the person of Jesus Christ do we find peace regardless of our circumstances, peace regardless of how swamped or put together we have our lives. So that's the first thing I'm hoping that the reader finds is peace regardless of how productive they are. Second, I hope they walk away with at least if they do one of the 32 practices in the book, the book is worth way more than the cost of admission. That was my goal. I tell people all the time, books are not $20 products. I think about that as $2,000 products because you're not just investing $20. You're investing, what, five, six, seven hours of your life? Mm. Man, it's got to be off the charts valuable for you to do this. If you do one of the 32 practices, I'm confident your life will be changed in radical, radical ways. So number one, 
piece regardless of circumstances. Number two, at least $2,000 worth of value (laughs) in adopting one of these 32 practices, right? And then number three, I want people to walk away with a comprehensive system for managing every aspect of their time, for their to-do list, to their calendar. I want one easy button to where it all ties together, that this is, in the words of one of the endorsers of the book, the last time management book you'll ever need to read, right? Mm-hmm. That, that was my goal. And so that's what I'm hoping people walk away with, a complete system to, like Jesus, be purposeful, present, and wildly productive. Yeah. Man, I love that. I, yeah, this will be required reading for anybody that I'm leading, anybody on my team, because it was necessary for me. At the end of last year, I was in a position where I was searching for peace through productivity. Like if I can just do more, if I can find more hours, if I can wake up, I was joining the 5 a.m. gang. I bought a watch that would shock yeah. me to help me wake up, trying to like <laughs> milk story, all the productivity the out of my day. And in reality, as I was doing that, I'd put off your book well, yep. then I listened to your book on a road trip and I was like, well, that's it. And I started texting Kinsey mm-hmm. and I was like, I think Jordan's figured out the root of all our anxiety. Like my mm-hmm. CTS is broken. I had to close some of these yeah. loops. I've got to structure my day better. It wasn't about doing more. It was about doing the right thing and saying no to yep. the other things. So I love it. Yeah, man. man. The value per page. <laughs> this is like that's a the goal, thing. right? Yep. I'm ready to enroll. <laughs> Are you ready to enroll? No, listen, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you say that, right? And listen, I want to be crystal clear. There's some level of peace that can be brought about by systems and software and processes, but not ultimate peace, right? <laughs> I, I made the mistake of believing that <clears throat> my systems were going to be the end all be all and I was always going to be happy and I was always going to be fulfilled and I was always going to be peaceful. Yeah, man, again, I think that's found in the person of Jesus. And uh, yeah, as, a, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, I believe that the God of the universe loves me on my most and my least productive day. Mm. That gives me like an insane level of soul rest and peace. But ironically, it's also the thing that makes me want to be wildly ambitious the next day to be yeah. more productive. That's right. right. Not because I need to get something from the work that the, that the work was never designed to give me, but because I want to be productive as a means of bringing pleasure uh, to the one who gives me that perfectly secure peace and love. Mm. Yeah, I love it. That was the theme of our first DCX was you're enough. And our prayer was not that you're enough is like the ending place, but it's actually the starting place. That's right. It's a great place to start building off of. And uh, yeah, I totally agree with where that comes from. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the reality of peace is uh, somewhat... Uh, circumstantial for most people, but I love what you're saying that there is this piece um, that is available to us that's literally beyond comprehension. Um, you know, as as we kind of seek peace, there are levels that we seek, uh, and like you said, systems or reading through the book and really understanding uh, how to put things in practice or in place in your life that'll give you uh, maybe like short term peace or this uh, idea of shallow peace. It can fill that void. Uh, but man, there's so much more uh, that the person of, of Jesus can fulfill beyond that. It's kind of mind blowing uh, when you've experienced it. So I love your heart uh, for the book and the heart for the reader. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to assume that all or even most of our listeners would identify themselves as Christians. So here's my advice to anyone listening. Right? Do not look to any author, this one included. Do not look to any piece of software, any tool. Uh, for your ultimate source of peace. Short term, what Chris said, shallow peace, sure. But you've got to find your peace regardless of circumstances, yeah. totally outside of your productivity today. Because man, I made the mistake for years of only feeling valuable, only feeling peace when I was killing it. And then one day when I wasn't, <laughs> whew, man, everything started crumbling. I didn't have a sense of self anymore. Right, that that's a really scary and dark place to be. Yeah. So you got to find that verdict for your life. You got to find that peace outside of what you accomplished today. That's mm-hmm. good. Love it. All right. Hey. So I was really worried this conversation was actually going to be an intervention uh, mm-hmm. because I'm in Enneagram Seven, and they asked me, "Hey, Zach, out of these seven things, what do you struggle with the most?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> I I don't even know how to narrow it down. Um, That's why this book was such a gift for me. And yeah, out of these seven things, which of these comes the most difficult for you? Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. So let me just give a quick rundown uh, of the principles real fast. Yeah. And again, these are seven, I believe, timeless time management principles we see exhibited in the biographies of Jesus of Nazareth, right? So number one, start with the word. Uh, and here I mean the word of God. If you're not a Christian, start with your value system, right? So mm. before you start your day, root yourself in what's most important to you, right? Number two, let your yes be yes. From the smallest to biggest commitment you make, get a hold of all that stuff and get it done so that you can be a keeper of your word. Number three, descent from the kingdom of noise. Jesus was insanely good at withdrawing to lonely and solitary places. I, I believe to think to pray and probably simply just to be creative, right? Number four, prioritize your yeses. Jesus didn't say yes to everything, neither can we. Principle number five, accept your uni presence. You cannot be everywhere at once. Jesus wasn't. Uh, and we believe that he was God and man, right? So neither can we. Principle number six, embrace productive rest, which sounds like an oxymoron, but I go at length in the book in describing why it's not. And then finally, principle number seven is eliminate all hurry. Right, We ought to embrace productive busyness, but never to the point where we feel like we can't hear ourselves think and breathe and look other people in the eye as we're going about the work. That's the difference between busyness and hurry. So, Zach, to your question, what's most difficult for me? It's probably embracing productive rest. So, as you know, uh, in the book, I talk about these three rhythms of productive rest that there are loads of scientific data saying is makes us more productive, not less. Number one is taking one day off a week, kind of this ancient idea of Sabbath. Uh, number two is getting an eight hour nightly sleep opportunity. Okay. I'm great at those first two, eight hours sleep mm -hmm. a night, check, Sabbath, check. Here's the one I struggle with, this third rhythm, taking breaks really, really good quality breaks throughout the workday, right? So scientists will tell you that our bodies tend to pulse in roughly 90 to 120 minute cycles, these circadian rhythms, where if you're doing really deep work at your computer, i.e. recording this podcast for an hour for 90 minutes, your brain is screaming for a 15 to 30 minute break. And if you take that break and break well, you're going to be a lot more productive in the next 90 minute block of work, right? And the maybe the simplest piece of advice I can give on this podcast, just one of the practices from the book, if you work with your mind, rest with your hands. And if you work with your hands, rest with your mind. Mm. Churchill talked a lot about why, because it's not just any break. It's not just any rest that recharges your batteries. It's working out different parts of your body and your mind. So for me, I work primarily with my mind as a writer. It's not restful for me to read a book, right? It's restful for me to do the dishes or to go for a run. Churchill worked with his mind and rested by laying bricks outside of his home, right? But Zach, man, I, I can lie to myself and think, oh, I don't need a break after this, you know, 90 minute block of deep work. I could just mm. keep going. And it's always a lie. It never works. Like I've got to make space for that 15 to 30 minute break in between those blocks of depth. Yeah. I, I love, love it, that. man. I think that's the one that I nail. So you said bi hourly, <laughs> right? 15 to 30 yeah. minute breaks. I yeah. That. So basically the cycle, Twice yeah, basically the cycle is uh, 90 minutes, of, 90 minutes of work, 15 minute, 30 minute break. And then you do it all over again. Awesome. <laughs> no, I was just laughing as I was reading through the book and thinking through that. Some people are like bi hourly, like twice an hour, 15 to 30 minutes, nailing yeah. it. <laughs> but yeah, like no, it makes so much sense. I mean, that, that we pulse was a, an interesting idea that I've experienced, but uh, I didn't actually know. And we can multiply our productivity. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah there's some pretty wild studies that we cite in the book. Like uh, there was some study with like 40,000 Samsung employees that reported like massive increases in productivity when they bake this into their corporate culture. There's a lot of other studies that uh, I cite in the book. But yeah, that one's a game changer, but probably the hardest for me to remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. And then the other thing for me was uh, there's this guy, Pete Scazzaro, Emotionally yeah. Healthy Spirituality. And he introduced me to this idea of a bastard Sabbath which I was like, can I say that? <laughs> but there was an article published in Christianity Today. So I feel like yeah. I'm all right. If they said it, I could. <laughs> yeah. But it was the idea of not resting, right? Like not redemptive rest, just wasting time. Like you're just checking out. It was the doom scrolling for me. It was the Netflix. 
uh, I wasn't doing anything productive. Like for work, I just wasn't doing anything productive. Right. You know? So I like the yeah, idea. It's like the difference. It's like this weird difference between uh, leisure and rest, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like le- leisure is like mindless consumption and, you know, Netflix and chill, right? Like rest mm-hmm. is, 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 are things that really fill our soul yep. uh, and make us more productive the next day. I th- And I think that's an important distinction, right? The point of rest, rest isn't the end. The point of rest yeah. is to make you more productive because I believe the purpose of life is going out there and doing great work in service of others, yeah. right? The rest isn't the end. It's a means to an end. Yep. Yeah, that's good. I think for me, the struggle, we were talking about this beforehand as well, is um, I think for a lot of people, they look at me and they think, man, you're very productive. Um But my biggest struggle is um, really taking the time for number one, Um, this idea that we've got to be grounded in our values and the why Um, I can, you know, I can uh, become so completely laser focused on what I want um, that the the way in which I'm getting there, um, it kind of uh, it runs people over or it doesn't let them engage. Uh, in that process. Um, I, I know what I want and I want to get there. So really taking the time to reevaluate those values, um, it's, it's so important to set me up to be productive in a way that uh, is fulfilling. Um, yeah. I, I've been and I've spent a lot of time being productive, um, but then it felt empty and shallow because it, it really wasn't toward anything other than my own desires. Um, whereas the reality of uh, really redeeming your time is uh, putting all those energies and efforts uh, into something that's forever uh, or yep. uh, that's fulfilling based on your values. So for me, that's been my struggle is, yeah, how do I like recenter myself on all this energy and productivity uh, towards something that's, yeah, that's worth my time? That's Man, and Zach forced me to one answer for what I struggle with. Let's face it, I struggle with all of this, just like all of our readers, right? Like I've mastered yeah. it at a different level, but That's I right. still struggle with these things, right? And what you're hitting on, Chris, is the difference between effectiveness and efficiency, mm, right? Without yeah. rooting ourselves in our values, right? And what we believe about what we want our life to accomplish and what it means. Yeah, we can be really efficient. Yeah. We ain't going to be effective. Yeah, right. right. Mm. And that's a big difference. Big difference. Real big difference. Yeah, I pride myself on my efficiency. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me the, too. The journey is terrible for me. Only the destination matters. And so, yeah, rooting yourself in your values in a way that makes that journey um, itself productive rather than just the destination is so much more fulfilling. So I love yes. that idea. And, I, and that really goes back to that redemption, the redemptive yeah. work of time. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, again, as a, as a Christian, the reason why I start with the word, why I spend time in my Bible every day, almost every day, not going to lie and say I read my Bible every day. (laughs) Uh, let's, let's be honest, uh, is because I want my life and my work to matter beyond today. I believe there's something beyond yeah. this life, and I want this life to count. This life's a rounding error, right? So knowing that, mm. I want to spend it, yeah. not save it. I want to spend this life in service of the eternal, right? So that's yeah. why, because if I don't know, if I'm not reading the handbook for what I believe about eternity, then I don't know what the nature of eternity is, and I don't know what matters today for eternity, Right. Yeah. So if, if I just want to manage my time better, reading my Bible doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if I want to redeem my time, if I want to steward it towards eternal purposes and purposes in line with my personal values, it makes all the sense of the world. It's the non-negotiable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, that's good. Whenever I was on staff at a church, I remember them telling, like, warning me, really, if you skip your quiet time, you're going to notice after a week, two, three days your family's going to start to notice after a week, after a month, your congregation will start to notice like there are rippling effects. And so it's important to everything that we do. And so I love that the heart of this book is not to redeem time so that we can be more successful, but really out of service for others. Yeah. And so our DCX theme this next year really is the fight for unity. Could you talk just a little bit about how 
redeeming your time today helps you to serve others in your workplace, in your families, your friends? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I love this question. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole purpose of the book. I, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's one of the most popular highlights in the book. It's like, it, if you're looking for a book on how to be more successful, like this ain't the one. Like mm-hmm. this isn't, I mean, it is, that's that's a byproduct, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But the primary aim is service to others. Because personally, I believe that's the purpose of life. That's what the most productive person of all time, Jesus Christ, says yeah. the purpose of life. Love my neighbor as myself. And in my experience, man, I've tried living for my own success and my own fame mm-hmm. and my own fortune. And I had a lot of it and found it terribly unfulfilling. Right. And in my experience, when 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 life, when I get out of my own way, when I achieve what Tim Keller, one of my favorite authors, calls the freedom of self-forgetfulness, mm-hmm. right? Not thinking lowly about myself, not thinking highly about myself, just not thinking about myself. Yeah. Man, that and, and work becomes about that. It becomes about, oh no, I just want to serve as many readers as humanly possible. Man, there's so much more joy and peace, and freedom, and fulfillment, and living in that space than anything I've experienced or believe can experience in this life. So that really, I'm I'm so glad you picked up on that, Zach. That really is the heart of this book. It is, hey, how can we be more efficient and effective at loving our neighbors as ourselves as we steward our time, this limited vapor of a life that we've been given? That's good. I love that. I think that the idea of uh, redeeming the time uh, in this um, idea of fighting for unity kind of also mix in this um, mode of honoring other people and their time. Yeah. So when I'm loose with my time, uh, it ends up spilling over. I know that it spills over onto you guys. <laughs> um, uh, Kenzie, you know, spends a lot of time trying to um, – leverage the time that we have with each other and so it's the worst thing uh and it's really anti-unity when i am uh not respectful of her time and and others this idea of of honor and so for me that's a big part of uh, redeeming our time is that it really helps me honor um, those that are trying to accomplish trying to uh, be good stewards themselves Mm -hmm. um and so yeah, I know that's a, a continual challenge for me is to not be flippant with somebody else's time. Yeah. Yeah. My big challenge is my open loops are actually people. They're conversations with people. And so I need to let my yes to be yes in order to honor those conversations and the people that are involved. And, uh, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Somebody, so Zach, you've mentioned uh, this, this construct of open loops a few times. And if people go pick up the book and turn to check, Chapter two, they're going to see what this is all about. Basically, an open loop is just anything personal or professional, urgent or distant, big or small, that you have any level of internal commitment to do. And Zach, you're right. Most of our open loops come up in conversations with people. For example, my kids running around the house will say, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. Yeah, we were at a science museum this weekend. I had a level of commitment to do that thing, and I wrote it down. And when people read the book, they get to this chapter, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so technical. This appears so hard. Why is it worth it? Let me tell you why it's worth it. Because Ellison, my eight-year-old, knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that when daddy says he's going to do something, he does it every single time, almost. I I drop the ball sometimes, but 99 out of 100 times. Yeah. Daddy's going to do it. He's going to pull it up. It's a matter of trust. Yeah, it's right? huge. And we, we we assign these like seemingly innocuous terms to this. We call it like dropping the ball or simply being forgetful. I, I, I call it not being the keeper of your word. Mm. And so do my kids. Right. And that's a serious deal for me. Yeah. And it, yeah. Anyways, I'm ranting, but no, that's why this good. matters. Yeah. It's, it's a good reminder for all of us that um, what's trivial to you. Um, is typically not trivial to the person that you've that you've dropped the ball with. Um, Good work. Yeah, it matters a lot to them. I know. Um, I keep looking at Kenzie. Um, <laughs> Kenzie is our. She's she's quiet, but she keeps the ball rolling because she does work really hard at redeeming the time. So yeah, does it bother you when like we don't show up to one of your meetings or? I hate to say it, but yes, it does. <laughs> I think. <laughs> 
there's just this level of accountability that I think this book provides that we all need to be who we who we want to be. Yeah. And you know, the busyness and the rush of work um, and life will distract us. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I finished the book and I'm like, that's who I want to be. I want people to know that they can count on me, that they can trust me. And yeah, you have to do it in the small things and the big things, but you can't just do it in the big things, you know, because if you miss all the small things, then people aren't going to ever give you the big things. Um, And so reminding ourselves that, yeah, I won't hold it against you, but Thank I need you, you to be better. <laughs> but, yes. And I want to be better. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I'm being honest, like the, sometimes the, the, the thought of um, letting other people down for me, it creates a lot of guilt around it. But I mean, there, as long as that, I don't stay in the guilt, but I, I really decide, no, that's the man I want to be. I want to be someone who, um, like I, I tend to focus on the big things um, and it's the little things that I'll be remembered for. I think of, we keep talking about this uh, Jew from 2000 years ago. Well, the reason that we, that we still know his name is that he was faithful in all things. And uh, that, that made such a huge impact on people's lives that they're still talking about it today. And I can't think of another way to redeem my time than to be timeless. Um, and this idea of legacy. And so I just want people to remember, not not for my namesake, uh, but the fact that I was a man of my word, that I I redeemed the time that I was given. So the, the book and the way it intersects with uh, unity and how we can really be for one another um, is just unbelievable to me how powerful that is. So uh, yeah, I love the book. And I, love, I love how it really drives us to unity. Yeah. Grace and accountability, structure and nurture. We need both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hold yeah. us in holy good tension. Work. So That's good. Right. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. I love the book. I'm going to continue to pass it off. I'm uh, now logging into the website and starting to unpack some of the online resources. Uh, trying to be better for Kinsey. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to actually take yeah, the next 10 minutes, Zach, and we are now going to do that intervention. Hey, there we go. <laughs> we're going to need <laughs> longer <laughs> than 10 minutes. Yeah, Kenzie, Jordan, and I have been planning this for the last four months. And so now <laughs> we're here. Um, yeah, we're going to make it a reality. That's right. Kenzie, we're ready you to go. go ahead and where do you oh guys want to start? <laughs> no, I'll bail you out and say, I agree, Jordan, that this book, I even said this to Zach after we finished reading, that there is so much more value than spending $20 on the book. Mm. You put so much thought and time and attention into the the detail of the practices, but then all of the resources you can find online, it's you have no excuse not to try one of these things because you thought of every reason people will not. Um, and so <laughs> I love the way that you um, set people up for success truly in this. And so, sh- I mean, not shameless or shameless plug for the book. It is incredibly practical and you have all of the tools even outside of the book to make this a huge um, investment and valuable for people's lives. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so okay. I appreciate, yeah. appreciate you saying that. Yeah. If there's any yeah. Enneagram sevens out there listening to this right now, <laughs> anybody who feels burnt out, anybody with ADD, read this book. <laughs> it will be a game changer. Yeah. Great reminders. Great heart behind the book. And uh, we just, we love what you're doing. Um, and we love uh, your heart and passion for letting people live out their giftings uh, at work uh, in such a, positive um, legacy format, like this idea that it's going to last forever. So yeah, love all the work that you're putting in. uh, And we're excited to continue this conversation with you at another time. Um, I know you got another uh, children's book uh, coming out as well. Um, We That's exciting. Brewing slowly. Yeah. Very slowly. You'd be shocked how long it takes to get a children's book out in the world. (laughs) Well, okay. Did you hear about this guy with that chat GPT on a Friday? He used AI to write a children's book. Then he used an online AI illustrator to illustrate the book. Oh, that's and by awesome. Monday, he had self-published. Put the children's that's pretty book. awesome. I mean, that's pretty much what you're doing, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. 100%. 100%. No, no your right. book. All of this is AI. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. uh, your book, man, it was good for me and my soul. As I read it to my kids, I'm reading it over myself. Uh, it was the highest selling book at DCX in DCX history. Most copies. That's crazy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I told uh man, that's so awesome to hear. And we we were very intentional 
I really want to write picture books that kids and parents love equally. I, I told yeah. my publisher on the front end of this first one, the creator and you I said, Hey, this has to be a Pixar movie or we failed. <laughs> Five-year-olds have to love it, and it has to make 55-year-olds cry. Yeah, That's the standard. Yeah. Hey, mission right? accomplished. Uh, and so we're, we're going to just try to keep crushing that model. That's so good. And so those are two of the books that you've written. There's a lot more a lot more things you are doing. Yeah. Kinsey just started us on uh, Word at Work. She sends us a picture oh, of cool. each page. Oh, cool. Awesome. We're doing it as a team. Yeah, that's so. great. So that's awesome. Yeah, and you can actually get – there's a weekly version, uh, weekly devotional you can get for free. Uh, it's called the Word Before Work at jordanrainer.com. There's a bunch of free resources there. So you don't have to immediately jump to buying one of these books that you guys love and are mm -hmm. so gracious uh, to say so. Uh, lots of free content there for you on the website. Love it, man. Well, thank you for the work you're doing. It's good and meaningful Thank work. you, guys. I love the work you guys are doing. Well, maybe we can keep doing work together. That's it. <laughs> All right, Jordan. Until next time. All right, guys. I hope you found that as helpful and valuable as I did. If you want more information on Jordan and the great work that he's doing, go to jordanrainer.com. And of course, we would love for you guys to stay connected to our community by going to dcxcommunity.com. If you would, just go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, do all the things, and, uh, and let us know what you thought. We'll see you guys soon.